So I was saying this is not the first time uh, Sir Peter has been to Ottawa, nor even the second time, but he told me this is the first time that it wasn't in January. But I guarantee him, <laughs> I gu guarantee him this was not the reason we invited him to give him a chance to see Ottawa in this beautiful time of year. Um, Sir Peter Knight is a professor of quantum optics and a senior research investigator at Imperial College in London and a principal of the Keverley Royal Society International Censor Center. He received his first degree and a, P, a DPIL at Sussex University, became a research associate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Rochester, very close to here. And well, I'll leave out a few things in between, but he joined Imperial College in 1979. And there he remained ever since, except for lots of travels. Um, since 2010, he's been the principal, as I mentioned, of the Keverley Royal Society Center at Chipsley Hall, which I've never visited, although he's often asked me to come, but I haven't managed to visit. I understand it's very beautiful. Uh, like Dr. Pinto, uh, Sir Peter serves on many boards, including the Council of the Royal Society, the European Advisory Board, Princeton University Press, and many, many others. I won't try to cover, su summarize them all. Today he will speak on using quantum optics and quantum supremacy, and I think it should be on, oh, you're bringing your computer up with you. So, Peter, welcome in the nice weather. So what I'm gonna talk about is, is something I've been passionate about for a long time, which is how do you use quantum optics to do something where quantum mechanics is giving you an advantage. Um, and uh, I use the word quantum supremacy um, is a kind of uh, arrogant statement that you'd expect from quantum physicists on quantum supremacy. I'll explain what it means as we go along. Okay, so what this is is a projection of how the world is going to change. Uh, 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 and you can see that what's basically happening is that economic power is moving east. Okay, that, that there is tremendous expansion of areas uh, of, you can see Canada more than doubling in its GDP. Uh, you can see the European Union less than doubling in its GDP, that's not just as a result of Brexit. <laughs> um, it's fallen off the map. Um, so that's the changing world. Um, now, what, what, what's our contribution to it as a subject matter in, in terms of quantum technologies, uh, which is the area that I'm interested in? Um, so what I've, I've inserted this one at the last minute to try and indicate that around the world, people have started to think about quantum technology as something which is an enabler to do, to do new things. And so looking at this map of things, you can see in Canada, uh, this Quantum Valley investment uh, around Lazaridis, uh, which is running at about 1.3 1 1 billion, uh, that you can see that within Europe, there is this 1 billion uh, euro flagship program that we're in, in the middle of putting together at the moment. Um, elsewhere, you can see uh, tremendous investment, the Chinese satellite launch that was uh, announced a few weeks ago. Um, in, in Singapore, 100 million investment in quantum technology, uh, uh, 100 million investment in, in Australia in the various centers of excellence, and so on. So around the world, people are thinking that quantum science is not only intellectually fascinating, but has the potential to do things which are unusual and transformative. And I, I normally give talks about what it's good for, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna concentrate today on why it's fun. Okay, so back to the things that I wanna be able to discuss. Uh, what's hard and what's easy? That's something I'm gonna try and describe. And whether something that's considered to be hard is considered to be hard independent of the machine that you're doing your calculations on. Uh, and, and whether quantum mechanics changes that. And, and two characters intervene at this point, Peter Shaw and Lob Grover, and something to which I'm very fond of calling the crypto apocalypse. I'm going to explain what the crypto apocalypse is as we go along. And then how quantum, quantum optics comes in. And what is quantum optics after all? It's the ability to manipulate light down at the quantum level, individual quanta, looking at using the ways in which quantum systems have this peculiar ability to interfere and so on. So I'll talk about these things, and uh, you'll hear a lot of people in the field talk about the Hong-U-Mandel effect, and I'm going to as well, 
uh, but you'll see two other names there, Loudon and Fern, and I'll explain why. And then I'm going to end up by talking about some things where quantum mechanics does demonstrate this thing called quantum supremacy. So this is a slide I, I borrowed from Steve Bartlett in Australia. Uh, what's hard and what's easy? And, and basically, you categorize these things in terms of complexity classes, things that are polynomially in, uh, easy, things that scale just polynomially with the resource. OK? So what's an example of that would be multiplication. And then there are MP problems. And then there are worse. And in fact, I'm going to describe a worse problem towards the end. OK? So P, they're polynomial. And, and problems that are, that, that are considered to, in, to be in the class P uh, are considered to be solvable, easy. OK? Um, and, and for example, the, the discrete Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform are, are sitting in P, basically. Um, NP, that's something where um, it, 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 it's extremely hard to use. It's, it's really hard in terms of its resource consumption, but checking you've got the right answer is dead easy. And the obvious one of that is factoring, where it's extremely hard, but once you've got the factors, it's dead easy to, to know you've got it right, because that's modification, which sits in P. And uh, there are all sorts of P and NP queries that you could make. OK, so let's talk about factoring. And, and an awful lot of what we do in the modern world depends on factoring being considered to be hard. OK, the way we trade, the way we, 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 we buy online, all sorts of personal identity is guaranteed by the hardness of factoring. OK, so given a number, what's its prime factor? So if I give you this number, 4633, three, three, the factors are 41 and 113. OK, and, and so when you look at these numbers, let's take a really big number, and that's RSA129. OK, there it is all written out in its glory. Um, and that's a 129-digit number um, that you, you're supposed to be able to factor. And it's tough, OK? So the best factoring algorithm that you can think about, uh, so a kind of Euclid one, to factor RSA 129 to 17 years on classical machines all ganged up together, OK? So a 300-digit number takes really quite a long time to do. The best algorithm for factoring a 300-digit number will take 10 to the 24 steps, OK? So at terahertz clock speed, that will take 150,000 years. So with a classical machine, what you can say is that because this problem is hard, there is a cover time for that particular number of 150,000 years, OK? Um, and the difficulty of factoring is the whole security. So when you, when you type in HTTPS, what you're doing is using a public key exchange, which is based on the difficulty of factoring. And, and of course, the, the origins of, public, of that kind of public key based on factoring is due to Ellis, Cox, and Williamson. Yes? Which is why it's called RSA. Ellis, Cox, and Williamson worked at GCHQ, which is our SIGIN agency in the UK, and they kept it quiet although the Brent Confidential Phones in the UK use it. RSA published it and formed a company. OK, so the internet security is dependent on that thing being difficult. Not impossible, just difficult. Right, so enter quantum. And first character that you're always going to get in, in a modern quantum talk is Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman in 1982 pointed out that it's really hard to simulate quantum systems. And the reason simply is that the state space for quantum systems is much, much bigger than the classical state space. So as things get more and more difficult to do, you just blow out the problem in terms of its complexity. And it was David Deutsch. Um, many people here would never have met David. I, I, I've known David for about 30 years. I've never seen him in daylight. Um, <laughs> David pointed out that machines using quantum processes might be able to perform computations that classical computers can only perform. For, and it was the ancestor of quantum algorithms. Right. 
So if we take RSA, and let's take RSA 200, which is a really big number, it's in that block, its factors are written in as the two, the two numbers on the right-hand side of that block. And for RSA 200, it would take about 10 to the 20 instructions. Uh, and we can, now, we can now crack that. We can get the factors probably in about a year now. OK, so you've got a cover time of about a year for RSA 200. That's not a worry at all, because you'll go to RSA 300 that will take much, 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 much longer. OK? On the other hand, there is a new algorithm due to Peter Shaw, newish, 1995, which says, actually, it doesn't take 10 to the 20 instructions. If you had a, a quantum machine, a quantum machine can do it in 10 to the 12 instructions using the parallelism and entanglement that you get in quantum physics. And that means that that, that RSA, 300, uh, RSA 200 goes down to hours. So the cover time is now. So if you had a quantum computer, the security of the internet through RSA is severely compromised. And that's the crypto apocalypse. Everything we got used to is dependent on that thing being hard. It may not be hard, because instead of using a classical machine, you go to a completely different sort of machine. OK. So computational security depends on difficulty. There has been an assumption all along that difficulty is machine independent, and that's wrong. OK, quantum machines are different. You want to see a nice review of this. Ashley Montanaro has written a great review in one of the, in, in one of the Nature Journal papers um, on, on just this. So algorithms and complexity classes can change if you go from classical to quantum. OK. So information security that we currently use is based on something being hard but not impossible. Right, so there's the crypto apocalypse, and uh, there's the National Security Agency publicly avowed that they're going to build one. Okay, right. So what's a quantum computer look like? Well, you don't, we don't have one. What's a quantum transistor look like? What do the quantum gates look like? Well, they're the kinds of things that I've tried to illustrate there. Um, I've got a great quote from Popular Mechanics from 1949, which says, computers of the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. OK? Um, that's, a, that's a quantum transistor, basically, on the right-hand side, which weighs considerably more than 1.5 tons. But on the other hand, there are options for using chips, of using photonic chips, which is at the bottom here, and using uh, atom and ion chips, the top one, which can miniaturize the system. So there you go, photons. We're going to use photons for this stuff. Photon is, is, is one of the nicest things. It, it, it propagates really easily. It doesn't, photons don't interact very easily with each other, except within the medium. So we can manipulate them through atomic media. So what would one look like if you, if you could get a photon? How would you know you had one? And let's do something simple with it. Um, now, the thing about photons, being quant quantum individual things, is their statistics are unusual because they're identical. So who did the first experiment on this? It's G.I. Taylor. G.I. Taylor later became, I don't expect you to read all that. It's just to remind me of what to say. Uh, G.I. Taylor later on became Sir Geoffrey Taylor of Taylor Rayleigh Instabilities, one of the great figures of, of fluid mechanics. But when he was a student, he was a student of J.J. Thomson. Back in Cambridge, J.J. Thomson said, I've been hearing about this Planck idea of corpuscular radiation. I wonder what would happen to interference experiments if you ran this thing at such a low light intensity so only one of these Planckian corpuscles would be in the apparatus at a time. It would require you to have a long exposure time. And so Jeffrey Taylor went away. He was a student. Um, and he set up an experiment in the attic of his house. There's a photograph of the apparatus. Um, the light source he described as being equivalent to that of a standard candle, wherever that is, burning at a distance of rather more than one mile, whatever that is. OK, and so there's his camera. He, put, he had a needle. He looked at the diffraction fringes. He set the thing up so that, on average, there was less than one photon in the apparatus at any one time. And he went off and sailed a little boat for three months, came back, developed the plate, and saw undiminished fringes. 
So that's a one photon experiment, one at a time, saying quanta don't do anything different to what you expected from ordinary wave properties of light. OK. But of course, that's only on average that was one photon. What about if you could get, if you say, honestly, that I've only got one. Not on average, but there's one now. And there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. OK, so lots of people tried that. Um, sometimes you could build an atomic source, one at a time, guaranteed. OK, the first person to actually do that was John Clauser, in extremely early experiments in 1972. He actually did see what we would now call anti-bunching. Never used that word. Then Jeff Kimball, Len Mandel, Philip Grangier, lots of other, Alan Aspe. And what they showed is that it's impossible to beam split a photon. Okay, if you have, both, if you have a, uh, a stream of single photons coming towards a beam splitter, it probabilistically goes through or is reflected, but never both. You can't beam split. Okay, so this is this indivisibility of a quantum particle. OK, there's a much, yeah, it is running. Good. And there's a, a, a more modern experiment done by a gang around Alan Aspe, single photon source, pulses of things, a, a Fresnel biprism, you get interference as the, as the beams overlap, and you can see the fringes build up photon by photon by photon, and there you go. That's a modern version of the GI, uh, GI Taylor experiment, but this time, one photon at a time, not one photon on average at a time. All right, so, oh, it just loves playing through to the end, doesn't it? Okay, so how do you get one photon at a time? And of course, one of my heroes in this field uh, is Leonard Mandel, and Leonard Mandel really was one of the great pioneers of how to get these, these single photons from parametric down conversion, where you take a crystal, you whack it with a UV pulse, signal an idler, and you use one to trigger the experiment for the other. So one photon comes along and says, hey guys, there's another one coming. Okay? So Leonard did that, and he, he, he worked out how to, to do these various things. All right, so beam splitters. I got slightly panicked by the previous talk. I thought, my goodness, I've got equations in mind. Um, I hope you don't mind. You've got some equations now. Okay, so there's a beam splitter at the top. As a field comes in, some gets reflected, some gets transmitted. Uh, and if it's a classical field, it's easy to do. You write down that the, 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 there's a transmission amplitude and a reflection amplitude. And for a 50-50 beam splitter, the moduli of these things, just one over root two. So that half and half, if it's an even matched one. Okay, so if you don't want to lose any intensity, you know that mod r squared and mod t squared have got to add up to one. But quantum mechanically, what happens then is that, of course, you've got to remember that these things have quantum properties. You've, you've got an input and an output. The input here I've labeled as A0 and A1 for the two modes that are coming in. And the, the output modes, there's A2 and A3 coming out. And there's a matrix which tells you how to get from one to the other. And it's unitary. Okay, You don't lose anything. And unitarity then demands that you get these relationships, which are really just the, uh, uh, the reciprocity relationships. OK, so everything's got to be unitary. You don't want to lose anything. Even though one of the ports might be empty, it's got vacuum noise in it. OK, so there you go. Inputs and outputs related by unitary transformation. OK, for a 50-50 beam splitter, you just get that pi over 4 that sits there in the unitary matrix. So now what I can do is to say, what I'm going to do is to take a single photon in one of the modes and no photons in the other one. Through the beam splitter, what happens? Well, of course, it's either going to be transmitted or reflected. That's what we know from the Taylor experiment and for its modern version. OK? So you go through the algebra, and that's exactly what happens. All right. OK, what happens if you put a single photon in each of them. Okay, so I've got two modes, each with a single photon, guaranteed from one of these gadgets. Okay, beam splitter, 50-50. What comes out the other end? Well, it's either all in one or all in the other.
but not one and one. Okay? The two photons are merged together. First, simple account of this, by the way, is in Feynman's lectures, if you look really, really closely. All right, so they, they come, they're, they're kind of sticky. Right, I'll skip that, don't matter. Okay. So how do, you, how do you understand it in terms of interference? There's an amplitude for reflection and an amplitude for transmission. And when you put it all together, you see that there's quantum interference and the property of one, one, one here, one there coming out is zero. They destructively interfere. Okay, and that's sometimes called, when you, when you look at this in terms of identicality, the hong u mandel effect. Or if you're really sloppy, the hong mandel effect. But U was an author, so he really does deserve to be there. Okay, so it's the hong u mandel effect. Or should it be the fern loudon effect? Okay, because I first heard about this not from Leonard Mandel, but from Rodney Loudon. And there is a paper that's essentially almost at the same time by Fern and Loudon on the quantum theory of the loss of his beam splitter, where he points out, or they point out, that if you put 1 1 in, you don't get 1 1 coming out again. And it's actually in Rodney's paper. Okay? Didn't do the experiment, of course. So it could be called the Fern Loudon effect if you really wanted. I'm going to come back to this forgotten paper business. All right, so passive beam splitters. How does a mirror work? Okay, mirror's made of stuff, and stuff's described by corner mechanics. How could you have a passive beam uh, splitter? It's made of stuff. Why isn't the stuff described by corner mechanics? Okay, and yet yeah, beam splitters are an integral part of everything we do. We never ever consider them to be active, or at least we hadn't until a while ago. So now I'm going to tell you a bit about fuzzy balls. What on earth is a fuzzy ball? I don't know what your picture of a photon is, but here's my picture of a photon. It's a wave packet. Okay? So what Vladimir Buzhek and I did, these were some of the most pointless calculations I've ever done, but they were great fun. Okay? I took a, a 2D box, okay, the 2D box formed a cavity. It had 256 modes by 256 modes. I formed a Gaussian superposition over those modes, okay? Then I solved the Schrodinger equation exactly, well, obviously numerically, to see how that Gaussian wave packet propagates. There it is. Okay, that's the probability amplitudes squared up, so probability spatially. You see this diffractive spreading. Okay, fuzzy balls, but it's purely quantum. It's the exact solution numerically of the Schrodinger equation for that superposition. All right, so that's a photon. Let's build a mirror. Now, what's a really, if you're a quantum optician theorist like me, what's a mirror? Mirrors are made of atoms. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll take a line of atoms Okay, you, I don't know if you can see the blue line here. Yeah? Maybe. That blue line is 1,584 two-level atoms. And I'm going to take exactly the same Gaussian superposition wave packet. Uh, okay, so now I've got 65,536 modes interacting with 1,584 atoms, but I've only got one quanta there. Okay? Turns out I can exactly solve it again, numerically. So I just integrate the Schrodinger equation for this line of atoms and a blob, this, super, this Gaussian wave packet coming in. And that's a fully ab initio calculation of a, oh, a mirror. Oh. It didn't get reflection and transmission. It's a mirror. Okay. Did you see the lovely interference between the incoming and outgoing bits? It's a mirror. I want a beam splitter, though. OK, so now what I do is I put a bit of detuning in between the center frequency of the wave packet and the, and the, and the line of two level atoms. And because it gets a little bit tougher, I've got a few, a few smaller atoms. I've got 881 atoms now. And again, I integrate it with a bit of detuning in. OK, that, that's going to be my beam splitter now. 
whoa, it works. A bit transmitted, a bit reflected. What's the point of this? Well, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. But when that wave packet comes into that line of atoms, at the time of the interaction between the wave packet and the atoms, the atoms and the radiation field are entangled. It is not passive. This is not a passive beam splitter. OK? The degree of entanglement is quite small as they asymptotically move away. It disentangles. OK, so we have active beam splitters. And Vlado and I got really quite carried away. Uh, you can build interferometers. OK, with atoms, atoms forming mirrors, atoms forming beam splitters. We actually built a, a fully quantum mechanical pinball machine as well. Uh, I won't show you that. So what a toy. You know, theoreticians have nothing better to do with their time. It was some of the biggest supercomputer calculators I've ever done, by the way. Even worse than the Dirac strong field one, Paul. A toy. Never, ever underestimate cunning experimentalists. OK? Here's Rev Letters last week. Well, just over last week. Strings of atoms, there's mirrors. Amazing. You probably can't see it from back there, but the top one is usually in Polsix group, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and then the bottom one is, is, is a, a multinational group, but principally in Paris. Again, strings of atoms acting as reflecting elements or beam splitters. Never ever, I, I, I learned long ago that whenever you predict something as being fun but unmeasurable, some bloody experimentalists will come and measure it. All right, and, and there's a little experiment from Eugene, there's a little picture of Eugene's experiment of having a little string of atoms. So it's fun, really. So what did we learn from that? Actually, beam splitters aren't bad as passive devices. They do disentangle, OK? But it will have a, there'll be a little bit left behind. And if you have zillions and zillions of beam splitters, the purity of your system as you trace over those unobserved degrees of freedom might actually be influenced by that. So now what I'm going to do is build a network. Right. So forgotten papers. OK? So <laughs> here's one that I forgot. Um, even though I'm one of the authors. Um, we looked at the requirements for linear optical networks. This, this, this is in the ramp up towards what became the KLM scheme. Okay, so Stefan Scheel, Kainamoto, Bill Monroe, and me. And we looked at the resources necessary to implement a set of unitary transformations. And uh, what we, there's a, there's a remark in here, we showed the probability distribution of outputs described by permanence, OK? And we've shown what operations are easy and what are potentially difficult. And many people have forgotten that we did this back in the dark ages, but we did. Right, so I'm going to tell you something about quantum walks next. So this quantum optician experimental community have given us these sources of single quanta. So what I'm going to do now is to implement a really simple quantum protocol to exploit as much as I can quantum interferences. And that's a quantum walk. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to start with Francis Galton, who is a famous probabilist statistician um, uh, in, in the 19th century. And certainly when I was at school, middle of last century or earlier, um, we used to d demonstrate the evolution to a normal distribution by having a board at an angle, dropping marbles through, pin board, bing, 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 and it forms the normal distribution at the bottom. Okay? Sometimes that's called a Galton quincunx, which is an amazing word. Fizzer of Letters claimed that Barry Sanders and I invented the word quincunx, which tells you a lot about United States grammar. <laughs> so, what are we going to do? How can I build a quantum version of this? So photons come in, and you see the pins are going to be beam splitters, aren't they? You go left or right, left, right, amplitudes, interferences. And so this is something that a lot of us played around for quite a long time, including John Sight when he came on sabbatical leave from Toronto uh, to Imperial. All right. There's, I thought I'd show you a Galton board. There's a Galton board. You don't get the noise. This is zillions of marbles rattling through this thing. 
Okay, I didn't put the sound on on the computer. Okay, that's a golden board. Now I'm going to build a quantum one of those. Okay, so let's just remind you about walking, what a random walk is. Okay, a drunkard's walk. So let me start with a walker, and I'll start at the origin, and I can go to the left or the right, depending on a coin toss. Okay, so if I get a head, I'll go one way, tail, I'll go the other way. So coin tosses, and, and then I'll get a probability distribution, and what I discover is the standard deviation of the distribution grows as the square root of the number of throws. It's a normal distribution. Okay. Let's do a quantum version. All right, so let's get the whole build up. There we go. So I'm going to have a quantum coin, obviously. OK? And so if the, if the coin is, 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 is a head, I'll go left. If it's a tail, I'll go right. That's no different from a clap. But you see, now that I've got this superposition now, heads left or tails right, if I started with a superposition of if my coin was in a position of head and tail, I have an amplitude to go left and right. OK? And you get this entangled state. And what you find on this one is it explores the state space in an interesting way. It's quadratically faster than the walk that was executed classically. OK? That's the same quadratic speed up as in the database search of, Love Gro of Grover. You can run Grover's algorithm as, as a walk. And you get this sort of distribution. It's got a lot of oscillations in it, um, which I, I've, I've, I've uh, singled out. You can't see the oscillations. They're, they're actually basically area functions. It's hard to say what a standard deviation is for that. Okay, But if I just say it's the width, it goes quadratically faster. OK, so that's a walk. It explores the state space faster because quantum mechanics does something interesting. And, and, and in fact, if you put a little bit of decoherence in, it, the, the interference fringes go away quite quickly, but the, the enhancement is still relatively resistant. All right. So if you can do it that way around, let's see what we can do. So instead of having this pinboard machine with marbles, now what I'm going to do is build a quantum optical version of it. And, and rather than do this with lots of beam splitters, I'll do it with a photonic chip, where I've got a lot of optical couplers, and the couplers I can fine tune so that they're 50-50, lots of interferences going on, and I get that kind of distribution. OK, so that's, that, that's a walk. It's been, it's been run experimentally in a number of places. OK. Well, you can't read the top. At least I can't. So it's been done in a number of places with a few photons. Um, Ian Wormsley and I and, and Peter Smith and Mujek Kim got slightly carried away. Um, and we've promised our funding agency that we're going to have a crack at doing this with 20. Some of you would have heard me last night saying that, that I'm not terribly worried about promising this because it's a five-year grant, and I'm unlikely to last that long on that. It's an extremely tough thing to do, to do a quantum walk, if you can do that. All right, but a lot of people are trying. It's not just the group in Oxford working with us. Um, in Bristol, also with Imperial College collaborators, they're having a crack at this um, in, in the group of, uh, uh, of Jeremy O'Brien and Mark Thompson and others, again, with a photonic chip uh, to do a walk. OK, and that one works beautifully. Um, right. So I want to tell you a bit more about two-photon interference, okay? Because two-photon interference comes in in a really surprising way. So now I'm going to turn from having got this thing to run as a walk, can it be used to demonstrate this quantum supremacy? Now at this point, I'm going to have a look at the extended Church-Turing thesis. Why not? Okay. So this thing's called boson sampling or Bose sampling. It's an incredibly simple algorithm that, that demonstrates the power of quantum computation. It's not really universal computation, but it's got elements of it based around interference. OK. And what Aronson and Arkhipov showed is that you can't simulate this very easily unless 
And there's a big unless in here. Unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses. In other words, going back to one of my earlier slides about P and MP being the same, which would be a really shocking result. OK. So a whole raft of authors have claimed that experimental Bose sampling provides evidence against or disproves the extended church Turing thesis, which is that any physically realizable system can be efficiently simulated on a Turing machine. OK? That is really something. Is it true? You might want to put noise in, errors, and then see what happens. And Peter Roder and others have, have, have got convincing arguments that one should not start to think that the, the hierarchy is collapsing. So remember, the whole process that we're going to do is very simple. It's quantum interference. I've got a load of, uh, of inputs, single photons that I'm throwing in in inputs, a load of outputs. In the middle is a unitary transformation, a lot of these beam splitters. Uh, I've, I've, I've taken this from Tim Ralph, who, who did a rather nice commentary about this in Nature Photonics. You could either simulate this process using classical computation, or you could do a quantum calculation. Okay, in other words, do it with this machine. Okay, and if you've got an input of n bosons in m modes, where n is actually bigger than n, what you find is that you get, after this unitary transformation, an output which is extremely hard to calculate classically. Okay, right, and extremely hard. How big do you have to be before it gets extremely hard? 20 will do it. So we're not talking about millions of bits, we're talking about 20. Okay, right. So there's my golden board. Oh, this hasn't come out terribly well. Okay. Now let's consider what happens. We've got photon here, photon here coming to a beam splitter. Well, we know about that. It's called the hong u mandel effect, isn't it? Or the Fern-Loudon effect. Okay, you get that kind of interference if the photons are identical and the beam splitter is balanced. Right. And that's where the permanent comes in. Remember, Bill Monroe, Stefan Scheele, Kainamoto and I demonstrated this more than a decade ago, okay? All right, so. The probability distribution you get out of this thing has a, there's your probability distribution. You've got some awful submatrix out at the end. And, and what happens is the, the submatrix is a matrix permanent. Apart from the people in this room who've done Bose sampling, and there are such people in this room, who else knows what a permanent is? Yeah, that's what I thought, that's what I figured. All right, what's a permanent? It's kind of like a really bizarre determinant. It's a determinant that's conspired against you and removes some of the signs, okay? So let's, let's take a two by two permanent, okay? It's AD plus BC, plus, okay? Not minus. There's a three by three, and it's that lot. Well, come on, it's hardly different from a determinant. It must be dead easy to calculate, yeah? Right. So let's look at the hong u mandel effect, okay? I've got this probability distribution with one, one went in, and what comes out the other end? You've got that permanent, so I'll write down what the permanent is. Oh, it's zero, okay? That's the first time a permanent has popped up. You didn't know it was a permanent in the hong mandel effect, probably. Okay, but it certainly is. Okay. What happens if we have a big permanent? Not two by two, because that's dead easy, but a big one. It turns out to be horrifically horrible to calculate. Okay, it's, it's called sometimes complete or sharp P. Okay, it, it's harder than NP. Okay? It's harder than the factoring. Sharp P is really vile. Okay? And that's why simulating what's going on in this. Okay, uh, sharp P was, well, I, I was going to skip that. That's the guy called Valiant did it. Who, who did the experiments? Well, a lot of people tried the experiments successfully. Um, in Brisbane, 
Andrew White's group in Oxford, in, in Wormsley's group in, in Rome, that's Matalonis' group, in Vienna, um, that, that's, uh, uh, help, um, Philip Walther's group. Okay, with three photons. Okay, so that's, that's early stuff. Okay, um, here's a four photon picture. Um, okay, this is a little chip that uh, Peter Smith built at Southampton University. And uh, then the four photon sources come in. Uh, in the end group, this is from James Gates. Um, in the picture, you can see a red light, laser light coming in on this one. Of course, you don't use red laser light, but it's hard to photograph the real frequencies that you use. Um, and that's a Bose sampling with four. Um, as I said, we're trying to scale this up so we can get to this business. OK, so here's our challenges. Reliable single photon sources to make this thing work are really hard. OK? You've got to minimize the losses. You've got to build a really good optical chip in this thing with, with, with minimal losses. Um, OK, you've got to try and balance it properly. And we, ne we need to be able to scale it between 10 and 30 photons. I think we'll get to 10. Um, afterwards, you start thinking about losses. But if you can get to about 20, a classical machine will not be able to verify that that was the distribution that you measure, okay? Which is cute. And that's quantum supremacy. You've, you've built a machine which can actually do something that a classical machine is unable to verify. All right. So here's the key points. Okay, that's our aim. It's really quite challenging. It's easier if you're a theorist like me, but it's really tough in the lab. Okay, and a classical computer, can it verify it? No, it can't. Okay, so we in our program grant, Oxford, Southampton, Imperial, have promised that we're going to have a go at this. All right. People have even come up with ideas that boson sampling, as a kind of primitive, can be used in a real computational result. So this is Alain Gasparuguzic uh, uh, and his group have talked, out the, uh, talked of ways in which you can get molecular vibronic spectra simulation by this boson sampling. Right. So, conclusions. Quantum interference, I've tried to show you lots of examples, starting with really simple things, going right back to G.I. Taylor. Okay, then the more modern ones, where you guarantee there's one and only one at a time. And then what happens if you've got numbers that interfere with each other by the Hongu Mandel or the, the, or the uh, Fern Loudon effect? Okay. And I've given you a toy model of quantum supremacy through, through these, uh, the, 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 these boson sampling experiments. Of course, in reality, as we scale these things up, there are going to be errors. You're going to lose information. You need to be able to do fault tolerance. And so if we're going to do anything more serious with this, these photonic chips are extremely promising, but we're going to have to, have to build memories, repeaters, probably have to do entanglement swapping to get stuff from one node to another. But it's a worthwhile journey. Thank you for listening. Uh, Peter. Um, a quick question about boson sampling. I mean, yeah. It's clearly a fascinating problem, um, but, but as you kind of point out, and many others have, it, it is, no one's figured out that it's useful for anything. And, and so the, but as you know, it, it, the people have talked about solving NP-hard problems, that if you find it, a way of solving it, some machine that can solve it, you can actually, if you can solve one, you can solve many others. Wow. And so do you think there might be an analogy here that if you build a machine that can solve the boson sampling, it can probably solve many other harder problems? That's, that's, that's an interesting point, because we focused on, on, on what we're doing is evaluating something which is, which is sharp P, OK? And we know how horrible that is. And, and theoreticians have been having a field day as to whether having insights from that, whether, are, whether there are other algorithms which the same thing can explore. Uh, and so if you read Aronson's blog, for example, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of quite fascinating stuff on that. So far, nothing that I can point to to say that's, that that is something that's unusual and useful. Um, but, but the computer science 
community are really quite fascinated by looking exactly at that. If, if you can solve sharp P using this, this simple interference, which is all this is, uh, then, then can it be used for anything else? That's why I threw up that molecular spectral one, which is a little bit of a cheat, to be honest. Is it? So it's not I, I, I was a cheat. I, I'll talk to you later. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it got published, okay? So uh, again, on the boson sampling, uh, I, I have a question that also my colleagues always in the community we ask the same question. So assuming that you have, uh, this is based on assumption that your machine works properly. Yeah. So there is no cheating yeah. on the machine. So assuming yeah. that there is someone that is cheating. Yeah. Okay? So there is a PhD student that randomly sends a photo yeah, yeah. there because you cannot do the quantum state tomography on the system sure. because uh, you, what you have at the end, you have a probability at the end. Yeah. So, uh, is there any way to verify that you have a random quantum system? I use the word of random in purpose, by the way. Is there any way in which you can see that a string of numbers is random? Is that, that, that's the basis of one of your questions. And again, the computer scientists, using kind of Bell tests, have started to, to get into this problem in a way that I don't fully understand, where there is apparently a computational proof of, 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 of randomness using kinds of Bell tests. I do not understand it, but there, there are such claims that are out there. Okay? But you're quite right that, about cheating. I, I'll tell you a horrible story, an anecdote. Is that we were, um, we, when I was a student, we would, we, the BBC came in to film some molecular beam experiment. And the afternoon they came to do the filming, the apparatus wouldn't work. And so they got me inside a laboratory covered with a very long screwdriver, moving the dial and moving it back again. <laughs> um, and so far, no one's detected it, although that BBC film is out there on the web. <laughs> so yeah, a cheater can do, can do terrible things. So, so looking at ways in which the people who are implementing the protocol do what it says on the tin in an independent way. Is, uh, so we said at the beginning of this boson sampling, N independent single photon sources coming in. How do you know they're independent? How do you know you've only got one in each of those modes and not a little bit of two or three or four? You know, so cheating inadvertent or deliberately is, is, is then to do statistical tests on what you've got is important. But I don't really understand this Bell statistical test of randomness yet. I, I guess many of you have seen this Dilbert cartoon of the random number generator in the finance department and they go down to talk to him and this demon says, all right, I'll give you a random number string. Nine, 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 nine. It's a finite string. How do you know it's not random? Okay, so tests are important. Sorry, that was a too long an answer. Over there. Thank you, that was an interesting talk, and I think we all enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to ask the following. You touched a lot on your talk about the theoretical foundations and the theoretical aspects, um, but how about the, the practical, the very practical aspects, like for example, the scaling, and here I would like to ask the following, a little bit more particularly. Uh, there has recently been a company, D-Wave and other uh, companies that they claim that they have already some quantum computers. I would like to ask you first of all if you, what's your opinion about that? If we already have commercial computers that might outperform classical computers and second how do you see this um, uh, practical implementation particularly the scaling of those ideas being uh, uh, going in, in the future? Is it because it seems to be really really tough if you take the coherence and, and the scaling issues. <coughs> in theory, it, it all looks, of course, incredibly fascinating, but the practical aspect is, is also very important, I think. Thank you. Um, right. I'm going to try and stay diplomatic for a change. <laughs> um, D-Wave is a Canadian company. I think it's extremely important not to be rude to one's hosts. <laughs> um, Maybe you were. As, as, if you look at D-Wave, it's doing something non-trivial. And certainly as the temperature drops in that machine, you can see that there is definitely tunneling between sites 
in a quantum mechanical way. What I've not been convinced about is that it scaled properly. As you increase the size of the machine, uh, it, the, the advantage is scaling in the way we expected. But it's a brave attempt, okay? Right. What about other things that are happening? If you look not at the annealing machine, which is what the D-wave machine is, but if you look at a, a, a thing that's, that's built up by gate circuits, the fact that with transmons or whatever, with superconducting circuits, you can now get fault tolerance. Your gate, your, 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 your um, ability to do an entangling gate has the right sort of fidelity that you can do fault tolerance. That already suggests to me that the journey is underway towards realistic devices. So if you look at what John Martinez has done, that's really fascinating and is extremely encouraging with the Google machine. Um, if, if, on the other hand, you look at what Charlie Marcus is doing with his topological stuff, where he hasn't got the error rate, uh, you know, the fidelity right yet, but with Charlie Marcus's stuff, a physical qubit equals a logical qubit, which is of a fantastic advantage. So I'm optimistic about those, but equally, if you look at what's going on with some of the iron trap gates, again, you're getting uh, four nines fidelity even in two-bit gates now with David Lucas. So I think, I think the journey is, is, is transiting from being physics to a kind of photonic engineering challenge next in terms of the scaling. But it's, it, it, it's going to be quite, quite a task still. But the fact that you've got the component parts with the fidelity that you need already suggests to me that that journey could, could well be. But one of the problems is if you're going to use this for a machine for example, for factoring, you're going to need an awful lot of circuit elements, and that's going to be quite considerable. So instead you could ask, what could I do if I had a few hundred qubits under appropriate control? And there, there are beginning to be algorithms that are kind of interesting, non-trivial. So my hero in this area is Krista Svor from Station Q, Microsoft Station Q, where what she's shown is that you can do non-trivial molecular simulations with a few hundred qubits, including things like polymer folding. Okay, so there are some really interesting things that might actually impact on drug discovery, for example, and on materials design, with just a few hundred qubits. Because two to a few hundred is a bloody big sp state space, and it is an advantage. So I, I wouldn't keep, for, I mean, I, I love the, the Shaw algorithm, because it enables me to use words like crypto apocalypse. But there are some things that en route are going to be valuable in terms of instrumentation. Now, that's quantum computing. I could give you five more talks about quantum sensors and so on, where we're going to roll out stuff in a year or two that's going to be practical. Uh, another question about the boson sampling. Uh, and this might be particularly important as you extend to like higher number of modes and photons. Uh, one thing that I would like to understand is uh, if we allow for imperfections, let's say, uh, an imperfect uh, right. uh, hongo mandel interference and mm -hmm. that each individual beam splitter, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, where we actually run into, or where the problem collapses into a classically solvable? The, the only published work that's been done on putting error rates into the boson sampling have been done by Peter Roda and a little bit by Bill Monroe and others. Uh, uh, and what they're already showing is that the, the output distribution is, is, isn't, you, you, you get rid of this whole permanent business quite rapidly. So um, if you look at, uh, on the quantum physics archive under Rode, R-O-H-D-E, uh, that's, that's where you'll see some, some, um, some, some simulations, numerical simulations of what happens with error rates on the distribution functions. But it's early days, I mean, it's literally just a few months old. So this is probably related to the question I just asked. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your definition of reliable uh, single photon sources? And, right. uh, and how this is an impact when N scales up? Yeah. And if reliable means deterministic to a certain extent? No, I, 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 you, you, I think if we were relying on, 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 on generating deterministic single photons, <laughs> probably we'll, we'll be here for a very long time trying to do this. I'm quite happy with these triggered photons, but by reliable, what I mean is that the, the, the contaminant, you know, I, I, I want a wave packet with one quanta in, 
with a contamination from two quanta, that amplitude to be really quite small. And some of the simulations that people are doing are, are what happens if in, in, in the injection you've got not one but a little bit of two and seeing what happens to that little bit of two in the interference later on. And that's where it starts to mess up the interferences. So people have started to do those simulations too, theoretically. Um, of course, if you look at the, uh, if you like, the single photon purity of these sources, of course, you, you would like to get the bit rate up at a reasonable level, but that's when you run into the problems of getting a bit of two and, and, and so on in the amplitude. So you have to take your time to generate it because of the contamination by two. If I could think of a really reliable source, one, 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 rapidly, uh, then I wouldn't have that problem. But uh, so far, so people have started to look at what happens, for example, on the Hong Mandel effect, if you have a bit of a contamination. Peter, I'd like to ask about something which you didn't mention explicitly, but maybe is implicit in what you said, which is about symmetry. Yeah. And we know symmetry is yeah. very important in quantum yeah. mechanics, and you mentioned molecular spectra, and of course, molecular physicists and spectroscopists classify uh, molecular wave functions according to their symmetry properties. Right. And so I wondered if you could comment generally about the role of symmetry in the design of quantum devices. So if we look at the symmetry of the, of the particles, what would happen if instead of having bosons we had fermions? And what happens to the interference structure when you have fermions uh, where you, you, you need to anti-symmetrize everything? Um, and then the whole Hong Mandel type of thing changes Instead of having this zero cancellation, you, you get a constructive effect rather than a destructive effect. Um, uh, in, in the probability distribution, instead of having permanence, you'd end up with determinants. Um, so were people to do these things experimentally, how would you do it? And that's kind of interesting because I've concentrated here on photonic versions of these things. But if I had cold atoms in a lattice, I can do a quantum warp with cold atoms. It's quite fun, and people have done it. Uh, Mescheder has done these experiments. So it's, it, it, if, if you have a, a bosonic lattice, you can explore that. Now put fermions in it. Presumably, instead of the destructive interference, you start to get other sorts of things. So symmetry can be tested that way around. I don't think I know of an experiment where in a fermionic lattice, people have done it. Okay? Be kind of fun thing to do, actually. But that's because that's I'm a theorist. Um, but, but you can see that's where people have worried about the symmetry of these things. Um, symmetry and identicality. I mean, this comes back to the question that was asked over here. You want these photons to be identical as well. So there's a tremendous challenge to get the mode matching right and all the rest of it, which theorists like me just take for granted. And we're experimentalists just, just kill themselves for ages to get right. It has to be identical to, be, to, to reflect the symmetry. So Peter, uh, you, you mentioned the work of Taylor in seeing interference effects with very feeble light, mm. and uh, you gave the modern view that uh, it's a cleaner experiment if you do it with heralded single photons. Mm -hmm. I've never personally really accepted that argument because how in the world don't we know that the parametric down conversion crystal accidentally sent two? Right. By photons during integration time, sure. and it's uh, uh, I don't see that you I don't see that that these modern experiments really have addressed the fundamental uh, objection to that, Taylor's approach. That that I think has been addressed actually, Bob, because I mean it's back to this whole business of you know uh, PDCs give you a string of, of these things as you crank up the amplitude. So what the, the test you can make is, is to do an anti, with the same setup you do an anti bunching experiment. Okay, so if, 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 you, if you're really going to get um, uh, a G2 at zero delay, which is a signature of anti-bunching, you could be fairly certain that it's spitting out one photon at a time. Okay, if, if there's a contamination with a bit of two, then, then there is an effect on your G2. And, and, and so there is a check that you can do independently of these things uh, uh, from the... From, from the the, the intensity correlations to make sure that there aren't two there. Or if there are two, it's of a tiny amount. But couldn't you do that with the uh, with Taylor's source as well? Well, in fact, in fact, you could have done, and that's the Hanbury brown Tuss experiment. And, and then you do find bunching. But it, it, oh, it, it, it's just philosophically more satisfying if you can say the, the probability of having no, it is, but it's one. 
It, it, it's the only physics experiment that, that Taylor ever did, by the way. He then went straight into fluid mechanics. Yeah. It drives us yeah. crazy. Whenever you do an experiment, the referees say you have to do it with single photons, with heralded single photons before it's acceptable for publication. And I've never accepted that argument. I know. It's a bugger, isn't it? Yeah. Life, <laughs> life is unfair. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question relating to uh, the coherence of the photons that you're using. Um, based on the source, the, the light could have low coherence or high coherence, and that could affect the experiment. And for example, if you increase the number of splitters, then the path difference between different paths could be extremely large, that coherence can play an effect. So um, how, how do you address that? Like in, in these experiments, do you assume they're high coherence? Yes. Photons or? Yes. Yeah. So, so the, um, the way that the experimentists address these issues um, is, is in the experiments I was showing you, these things are fiber coupled into the optical coupler. They work really hard on, mode, on, on the way that the mode structures are, are, are produced, the coherence properties are, are, are generated. So a lot of the work by the experimentalists is to characterize uh, the mode nature of, of the input states. Uh, and it is hard work. If, if, if you don't do that, then you don't get the right overlaps, you won't get the cancellations that are characteristic of the hong mandel effect. So you're, you're right. It's absolutely essential to do that. And in these, they do. Okay? If you, if you imagine a free space version of this, by the way, then you can imagine the geomet you have to do tremendous work on the spatial coherence that's going on and, and the wavefront matching. In, in a fiber, it's a bit, uh, and, and, and in the, uh, the integrated structures, the structure is taking care to some extent of that. So I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank Peter for a fascinating talk, a wonderful talk, for his, for, for his patience in putting up with many questions. But I have one last question. Oh. Since you've been here in the summer, yeah. In the winter? Yeah. When you come back the next time, summer or winter, what's your choice? Oh, that's an unfair question. <laughs> um, I, you, you know perfectly well one of the answers to that is being an Englishman, the fact that you can walk across a river on the ice is quite something. And you've, you've, you've pulled that stunt on me before. <laughs> um, but, but I tell you what my favorite uh, so far is. I, mean, I can see that at the moment the seasons are changing. And that's fantastic colors out there already. So, yeah, I love it no matter what time you invite me. Thank you very much, Peter.